G'day and welcome back to RC Model Reviews. Whiteboard time! And today I want to talk about the Hall Effect because I just reviewed the Tyrannus QX7S and it has Hall Effect sticks, Hall Effect gimbals and a lot of people talk about Hall Effect but what the hell is it? What does it mean? What does it do? What happens with the Hall Effect and why do we use it? And what does use it? Because, okay, Hall Effect sticks but you might not be aware that the Hall Effect is actually widely used in all sorts of electronic gizmos. If you've got a flight controller, the Compass probably uses Hall Effect. Your smartphone has a compass that uses Hall Effect as well and there are all sorts of electronic measuring equipment that use Hall Effect. Basically anywhere that you want to measure a magnetic field, that is the direction or the intensity of a magnetic field and therefore sometimes the intensity of an electrical current because when a current flows through a wire creates a magnetic field you can use a Hall Effect sensor to measure the strength of that field and therefore you can tell how much current's flowing in the wire without even breaking it to put a meter in. Simple A. What fantastic stuff. So, Hall Effect, what is it, how does it work? Well, basically, the Hall Effect is the way that a magnetic field interacts with the flow of current through a conductor, or a semiconductor, doesn't matter. Which, similarly, now there's a whole lot of Hall Effects, just to be honest, let's clarify things. There are quantum Hall Effects, and there are a raft of different ways the Hall Effect works. But, we're going to talk about the simplest way, that is the effect of a magnetic field on a conductor. So here we have a conductor, right? And uh, he will take your ticket and punch it so that you know, you can't use it again. No, not, not that kind of conductor. He actually stands in front of an orc. No, not that kind of conductor. It's an electrical conductor. We've got a positive voltage source here and a negative voltage source. And of course, because they're connected through a conductor, we get a current flowing. And a current is a flow of electrons. But for those who don't know, I'm sure most of you do, but for those of you who don't know, electrons don't flow from positive to negative because they're negatively charged. They actually flow the other way. So uh, we, if we were to draw, let's use a different color because electrons are not black. They're a completely different color. Oh, so many colours to choose from. Thank you, the person that sent me all these whiteboard pens. I hope this one works. It does. So let's assume that the electrons are travelling through the conductor. There they are, the little red dots. They're not red, actually, but I've used red. Little red dots, they travel along here, through there, back there. There we go. Simple. That's just a normal circuit conductor. Right. What happens if we put a magnet, magnet near this thing here? Well... Well, I'll draw a magnet in green, because I have a green one. Let's put a magnet here. And I'll just use the good old horseshoe magnet from cartoon times. There we go. <laughs> so this has got a magnetic field. Magnetic field now suddenly is working on this piece of conductor. In fact, I'm going to change that magnet, because that kind of magnet wouldn't actually work very well. I'm going to put it on my crap-ass whiteboard. A more regular magnet, like this. Here we go. And it has a north and a south pole. Doesn't matter which way around for the purposes of this particular demonstration. But um, so this has a magnetic field that is now enveloping our conductor. What's going to happen? Nobody knows. That's why you're here to find out. Well, what happens is the magnetic field magnets attract stuff, right? Of course they do. That's what makes them magnets, really. Um, and where you've got a flow of electrons, the electrons will be attracted or repelled by a magnet, depending on which way around the polarity is. I haven't. I can't remember which way around it works long time ago I learnt this stuff. But uh, let's assume that electrons are attracted to a magnetic north pole. Okay? So instead of our electrons travelling directly through our conductor like that, what's going to happen to them? Well, they're going to go like this. They're going to be sucked over to one side by the magnet. Makes sense, doesn't it? That's what magnets do. So now we have an interesting situation. Because within this material, we have electrons that are roaming around from the shell of one atom to the shell of the next one, bouncing around. But they're all accumulating on this side. And what happens when you have an abundance of electrons? Well, you get a negative charge. So if we were then to put a meter on here, I'll use a different colour again because all these things need to overlap. Let's assume we take a little multimeter here. Use an old one, shall we, with a needle? Hey, now retro. Let's assume we take one lead from there and put it on there. And the other lead and put it on there. What's, what are we going to get? Well, actually, the interesting thing is we will actually get a voltage appearing on here because this has got a lot of electrons, so this is actually going to become... If I can get the top off, nothing. This is going to become negative. And so relative to this side, that will be negative. So there'll be a voltage appearing. So this becomes by... Um, well, a relative to that side, it becomes a positive. So we have positive and negative. So our little meter will go... Doo -doo 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 -doo. It'll show a current. And the, the amount... Or show a voltage. The amount of voltage that it shows will be dependent on strength of the magnetic field and also the orientation because if we were to turn that magnet around suddenly 
the electrons would be repelled, they'd go over this side. So the, the polarity would change on that piece of conductor. Simple stuff, isn't it? So all we're doing is basically using a magnet to attract electrons and then measuring the difference when all the electrons end up on one side. Now that's a very simple Hall effect. It actually gets a lot better if you use a semiconductor because semiconductors have electrons and they have holes. Yeah, honestly, they do, but you can't see them. Uh, a hole is a, an electron that's missing, an, uh, sorry, an atom that's missing an electron on the outside. So what happens with them is we end up with the holes, which I will draw in rapidly running out of colors here, brown. Holes are the opposite to electrons. So the holes will all accumulate over this side, and let's just draw little circles for holes. The holes will be attracted to that side. So you end up with a greater, you, the needle will read even more because not only do you have the electrons accumulating on one side, but you have holes which are positive in a semiconductor um, accumulating on the other side. So now you've got even more voltage. So a semiconductor Hall effect is going to be much stronger. So that's why most of the Hall effect sensors we have use semiconductors, not just a piece of wire or a little, you know, piece of metal to do the conducting. They use semiconductors and they get a much greater effect. But even so, this effect is really, really small. It's a tiny little voltage. So what has to happen is we have to amplify it. What normally happens is we have our whoop, semiconductor Hall device and we take that small amount of voltage and we put it into an amplifier. So it will go like this. We use a differential amplifier sometimes, which means it multiplies the difference between two voltage sources. So one goes in there, one goes in there. And out here, you get a much bigger, it can be, um, has gain. I can't write for hell today. Um, yeah, has gain. So this might only be a few micro volts, millionths of a volt, amplified enough and up enough and it becomes lots of volts. And that's what happens in our stick units on our radio control systems. We have one of these devices and we have a magnet that swings by as you move the stick, swings by and creates a greater or lesser amount of voltage coming out of here. That voltage is then amplified and it makes it so simple because you can replace a normal potentiometer. Because if we look at what a pot is, oh, juggling pins, um, let's just clear a bit of space on the whiteboard because I'm running out. If I take our magnet away, um, a potentiometer, which we draw like this, has a connection there, has a resistance there, and it has a wiper there. So we have three wires there. We put a positive voltage on one end and a, ne or, and a negative on the other. And then this voltage here will go up and down as we move the pot with the wiper across the pot. That's old school. With the Hall effect, as we move our magnet up and down, then this voltage will go up and down as well. So there's our equivalent to a pot. And if we make, amplify the micro voltages coming out of here far enough, we can get zero to whatever volts. So normally this will be like plus five and zero. Let me just simplify that. This will be five volts and this will be zero volts. So this output here can go from zero to five, although it doesn't because that's only if we turn the pot the whole way. So normally we're getting like, you know, between maybe two and three because the pot's only moving a few degrees in the middle. And so we can get the same output here. We can get a output of zero to five or in reality, two to three volts. So we can just wire the Hall effect unit straight in, straight in. It's getting five volts and zero volts and it'll give a variable output. Simple as, easy peasy. Now, as you can see, on the pot, this little bit here, it's just a little physical arm that wipes across a carbon or a polymer surface to vary the resistance. But anything that moves and rubs wears out over time. That's why pots tend to wear out. Hall effect, there's no rubbing parts. There's moving parts, there's the shaft and the magnet, but it doesn't touch the Hall effect device, so it never wears out. Maybe the shaft would wear out after a billion years of turning, but the actual sensor itself doesn't wear out. Now there's something interesting I'm gonna be trying out in a later video. Uh, Hall effect sensors tend to be um, influenced by magnetic fields, obviously. So I wonder just how well the Hall effect sensors in the stick units on the Tyrannus are protected from magnetic fields. If I walk down the flight line with a great big magnet, is everyone's radio system going to go crazy because the Hall effect sensors are reacting to a, an external magnetic field? I don't think they will because magnetic fields are interesting things. They reduce an in intensity uh, they, they have for, well, no, it's the inverse square law, right? So every time you double the distance, you get a quarter the magnetic field. So that means you have to be really close to get a strong effect. If you've got a little magnet really close to this, it's going to have more effect than a big magnet that might be, you know, 10 or 12 feet away. So I really don't think it's going to have an effect because also imagine if you turned around the Earth's magnetic field 
if, it, if this was a, a problem, the Earth's magnetic field would change a trim. But it doesn't, because these devices operate very, very close proximity. So there's very high, what we call, um, magnetic flux intensities here operating on the Hall effect. It needs, you know, the kind of Hall effect unit we're using here is designed for high magnetic intensities, not for the very weak magnetism you get from something like the Earth's magnetic field, which is where a compass works. Compass, you know, the little compasses in our phones and our flight controllers, they are designed differently to respond to very, very weak magnetic fields. These, only very strong magnetic fields. There you go, Hall effect. I hope you learned something today. And uh, if you want to know, if you've got questions, then put them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer them. I actually learned this stuff years ago, so I have taken some liberties with the facts to make it easy for you to understand. Hopefully you do understand it. And this is uh, one of my whiteboard videos. If you've got ideas for other whiteboard videos, then please let me know, and I'll do my best to come up with something that hopefully explains these complicated concepts in simple terminology. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.